So hi everyone, my name is Kemal Chainta and I work for Thousand Eyes uh, where we, as a customer success engineer, where we strive to provide network intelligence solutions to our customers. Um, first of all, thanks to INOG and Riot for hosting us here tonight. Uh, it's a beautiful venue, so thank, thank you guys. Thanks for the opportunity to speak about this. This is something that I'm quite pa passionate about and uh, tonight I'm gonna be speaking about troubleshooting and monitoring. So, Let's get started. So when we think about the troubleshooting by itself, uh, what we really know based on our experience is that it's always reactive, right? So there comes our first important question. Does it actually need to be reactive, right? And to be perfectly honest, I don't know. Uh, I haven't seen the uh, research papers published on how to do it proactively. Um, I know that between us we have people here that are working for large-scale companies and those large-scale companies have the quite large uh, data sets and with the rise of the machine learning and, and uh, algorithms that are popping up like a mushrooms every single day, uh, there might be something that can be done to address this, but so far uh, no research has been published. Hopefully we will see that changing in the future. When it comes to troubleshooting and troubleshooting lifecycle, it's always uh, pretty much the same. You have issue, regardless of how it happened. You have troubleshooting effort to resolve that issue using uh, basic troubleshooting tools, which uh, regardless of the state of the co company you work for, for and regardless of the state of the monitoring solutions or troubleshooting remediation fr frameworks that you are using and everything else, it always boils down to the ping and trace route for whatever reason. And then basically, uh, once you are done with troubleshooting, you basically derive your conclusion based on the root cause analysis, if you can, right? And based on that, you basically learn some lessons. Now, I briefly mentioned ping and trace route, and I mentioned them as a really good starting point uh, for troubleshooting, but um, all, of, all of us in this room pretty much know that in majority of the cases they are not enough, right? Like they are giving you a certain amount of information, but like not enough. So we basically started looking for some more tools and like one of those tools is MTR. We use it to figure out whether we have the existent pocket loss in our networks, right? Uh, we have Paris trace route to, that gives us information on the ECMP paths in our networks. We have Dublin trace route. Uh, I hope that the guy that wrote it is in this room. If you are, please, Talk, talk to me, uh, which is basically a tool that uh, peaks beyond the NUT boundary. And there is complete suite of the tools that are created by our friends from NLNOG, um, and it's called NLNOG Ring. And what it does is basically once you start participating, you have multiple vantage points to monitor your network, which is pretty cool. But there's still a problem. You are still reactive, and you are very late to troubleshooting party, right? Which brings us back to alerting. So how do we find out about the problems? We find about the problems from various sources. And I, I'm, I wrote various sources uh, just uh, as a nice wrapper for end user reports. And at the moment, we are in late November 2018. And Regardless of who you are and the company that you work for, if you are relying on customer to tell you that there's a problem in your network, you can consider it tragic. Uh, we rely on syslog, we rely on SNMP, we rely on uh, various telemetry solutions, right? Uh, like GR, uh, gRPC from Google and stuff like that. And now we have improved toolset on one side and we have the alerting solutions on the other side or at least uh, solutions that are telling that there are uh, potential problems in our networks. So what's the problem? And the problem is time. The time basically indicates that we are too slow to respond to the alerts. Basically, alert gets, gets raised uh, and it takes a couple of minutes in best case scenario for human to interact uh, about that uh, uh, alert, whatever that alert is. And in computer time, a couple of minutes is like a couple of centuries, right? So in most occasions, you are pretty much late to the party of troubleshooting that event 
other than like you are dealing with something catastrophic, right? So then we started um, thinking really hard uh, to figure out potential improvements for this particular problem. And um, we sat down and think hard and basically we came to realize that the only solution is to automate uh, those alerts. Like basically alert gets raised, certain remediation framework uh, kicks in and resolves the problem, right? So as part of that discovery, we discovered Python and its countless libraries that are helping us uh, on everyday basis. Uh, we discovered Go programming language and its uh, awesome concurrency features, depending on the scale of your network and what you are doing. And we discovered that some smart people basically tried to help us with the already written frameworks that are sorting out the problems, like Ansible, for example, there are companies that are using it for uh, data center deployments or Napalm for the, uh, rem as a remediation framework. Uh, tonight we are gonna have the talk about salt for, that's used for deployment and so on and so on. So it's been addressed, right? So basically we got some interesting results out of automation and those results came from the fact that we shortened the time between the alert and what we do about the alert, right? And the question that we started asking ourselves is basically, uh, are those vendors that we are buying the equipment from are telling the full truth about the performance of our networks, right? And uh, we started raising the questions based on the root cause analysis or lack of those, like line cards are rebooting because of the solar flares. Uh, like no root cause analysis. Just reload your net line card. It's gonna, everything is gonna be clean. Uh, context for exactly that problem that you are troubleshooting are not user exposed, oh my God. Or if they are exposed, you need to be magician and wizard and know like deep down level details about the ASIC and implementation of that chipset that's installed, in, installed in that line card. And you know, and you need to know like uh, low-level low counters and stuff and where to look like. Uh, not scalable at all. How many times have you heard about mis uh, miscrafted packet, single packet, taking fully redundant like six plus one uh, backplane of large chassis, ASR, PTX, or whatever that is, uh, taking completely down? It was supposed to be redundant. That's the purpose of it, right? But yet one packet, different size, wrongly crafted, take complete chassis down. And in the end, like basically you have a control plane that cannot handle stuff. Now that we got in this situation where we have various collections uh, and we have the situation where we have uh, telemetry solutions, SNMP, syslogs and stuff like that, all of a sudden like you are getting blackouts in your monitoring purely from the, from the perspective that you are hitting your control plane on your router really hard. So that's a problem, right? So the real product that automation gave us is basically vendor distrust. We rightfully started adopting what they are telling us and basically we decided that it's time to do something about it. And what did we do? We basically started doing active network monitoring, right? So what is Active network monitoring. Active network monitoring briefly is type of the monitoring where you are simulating user initiated flows uh, and you are measuring performance of, of those flows without relying on uh, those vendor provided machines to tell you anything about the performance of those same flows, right? So you are basically making your own conclusions. However, uh, that came with the price. And the price of active network monitoring is quite simple, right? It's hard to implement, basically. So if you're a large-scale network, uh, you basically uh, moved to work, or large enterprise network, for that matter, you moved from a uh, typical three-layered uh, Cisco advertised design towards the class fabric design. And in order to do that, you started de-aggregating chassis uh, uh, to basically limit the blast radius. So you don't want to lose 160 terabits of traffic once your uh, miscrafted packet takes your back fully uh, redundant backplane down uh, and take, takes down 160 terabits of capacity down, right? But 
those smaller scale devices came with a price and that price is basically a uh, small fib small rib so basically network designers started being creative and started basically uh, started basically uh, creating different solutions for that and the control planes just is not powerful enough so as an intermesso um, if you are not large scale company and as because I'm saying this purposely because large scale, scale companies are in position to build white uh, white boxes, um, you rely still on the vendors to provide you with the smaller scale devices. And I did some small research about that, and that small research gave me following results: Juniper PTX 1000, uh, 2U devices, 24 by 100, 2.88 terabits of capacity; Cisco NCS or Freta, uh, 32 by 100. 3.2 terabits, Arista 7170 series, 6.4 terabits in, and 32 by 100, right? So are those really small scale devices, right? I guess it depends on the angle, right? Um, like it's better to lose uh, between three and 6.4 terabits of capacity than 160 on fully loaded ESR. Um, and on the side note, you get some benefits uh, when it comes to power consumption, right? So. You lose something, you get something, right? Um, so more challenges came when it comes to uh, implementation of the uh, active network monitoring. And those uh, are basically mostly common in the label switch networks, uh, uh, which are typically backbones, uh, where uh, features like out of bandwidth are uh, resignaling the LSPs depending on the conditions within the network, as a result of which you are dealing with the problem of moving target. Like, how can you see where the problem is when the target is always moving? Like, it's super hard, right? So people started creating uh, really interesting solutions around that, but like, to the best of my knowledge, nobody has it fully figured out. Which implies that Pretty much nobody has 100% active network monitoring coverage, and we are aiming that to fix the problem with the passing, active, uh, passing network monitoring in form of syslogs, SNMPs, and stuff like that, right? But for the sake of this presentation, let's imagine that you manage to push active network monitoring fully. Like, you are all sorted out, your network is fully covered, you are happy, right? Did we forget about something? Oh, yes, we did. We forgot about this bad guy the internet, right? So what's the problem with the internet? Like if you're a content provider, majority of your egress traffic is going to face uh, the internet somewhere down the path, right? So uh, life of the packet is gonna depend on this uh, unstable, unstable public infrastructure, right? So when it comes to that, we need to think about a couple of different metrics, right? Do you know about the packet loss, right? Uh, do you know about the latency on the internet? Do you know about the jitter? Do you know about the BGP advertisements and withdrawals? And do you know about prefix hijacks? We just recently had the example where a large scale company, which is advanced in many different sectors, suffered something like this just a week ago or something like that. And this is just stretching the surface of the problem, right? When it comes to internet, like basically, do you know how, how does your uh, transit provider uh, basically works. Do you know how oversubscribed you are? Do you know how, how does your public peer is going to behave in this particular case? Are you protected by the filters and, and stuff like that and so on, so on and so on, right? So more challenges uh, came from the perspective of services. Now, uh, on last INOG, there was a talk uh, that someone delivered uh, about the differences between SREs and NREs, and I found it to be a uh, quite interesting talk. But both groups tend to do something quite interesting, and, and that uh, thing is they tend to blame each other, right? Like, basically, service-related people are say, straight away saying, like, oh, this is network. And network people are like, you are wrong and I'm gonna prove you wrong, right? So don't be that person. Like basically what you need to know do is you need to know your services, right? So at the end of this talk, I want to uh, suggest a couple of solutions. Basically, first one is learn how to code because your job might depend on it. I am honestly, um, I'm honest believer of the fact that this job, uh, network engineering job, won't exist in a couple of years in the format it exists now. And majority of the large scale companies are very uh, deep in the uh, remediation frameworks that they are building or using off the shelf solutions. And enterprise networks are realizing this. Um, 
utilize research papers about the data center design and backbone designs from other companies that publish those researches. Like, why would you learn on your own mistakes, learn on someone else's mistakes, be ahead, and try to basically extend your, uh, active and passing network monitoring, regardless of how hard that, hard that is, or just buy the off-shelf solution that does that, right? Um, extend the uh, active network monitoring to the uh, backbones because life of your packets depends on it. And in general, like monitor the performance of your uh, internet pods because the life of your packets is going to depend on it and even more importantly, patience of your customers is going to uh, depend on it. And lastly, know and monitor your services. Thank you very much.